Thanks, everyone. Um, this is the first time I'm doing this talk, and I'm pretty excited about it. So, it, and, and I'm doing something different. It's a very visual talk. There's lots of uh, pictures th that are, are make up this talk. So um, you are my test subjects in this. So thank you for coming. So yeah, as he mentioned, this talk is about the, um, the evolution from monoliths to microservices to serverless. There's, there's this really interesting uh, evolution that's going on right now. I've never, I've been doing uh, in software development for way longer than I'm willing to admit. And I've always loved it. And it's been fun for me to watch it for such a long time because I really feel that kind of exponential growth that we're going through. And right now, it seems like we're just, you know, things are just happening so fast, we're moving straight up. And, and um, the, the hot new thing right now seems to be serverless. It, you know, last few years it was microservices, now it seems to be serverless. So now we got kind of these three significant architectural patterns that we're involved in, and each one of us is involved in in maybe different stages. So <clears throat> I want to walk through this, this kind of visualization to make, hopefully make, uh, you know, convey more words than I'm going to say by using these pictures. So in, the, in this flow here, this big rectangle represents the monolith. And of course, what's next to it represents microservices. And what's next to that represents serverless. And then at the end of this talk, <clears throat> I'm going to make a fool of myself by trying to predict some things about maybe what will happen in the future, which is almost impossible. So I'm going to be wrong, but I figured I'm going to, what the heck, I'm going to have some fun and maybe say some things that I'd like to see happen as, as, as things evolve here, maybe hopefully will happen. So. One thing that should be fairly obvious when we look at this picture of monoliths and microservices and serverless is that we've got a change in the level of granularity where with a monolith, we have a single deployable unit. With microservices, we have more deployable units, a little bit finer granularity. And then now with, with serverless, we even have more granularity. So why, are we, why is this happening? Why are we doing this? And <clears throat> there's all kinds of things that we have to consider f uh, in this area. But I, be I think the biggest thing that should be driving this whole thing is what I'm calling innovation velocity. And what I mean by this is that, you know, we get, you know, we're, you know I'm assuming that many of you are technologists, just like I am. We see shiny new technology, and we get all excited about it, and we want to play with it. But we also have a responsibility to our employers, to our business, to our customers, to give them features. And in fact, I think for most organizations today, they're realizing that, uh, you know, I, I've actually heard some companies say, we, we realize we're a technology company that happens to provide financial services, which is like a 180 degree flip. And as more and more companies get to this realization, they realize that they're going to live and die by their ability to innovate. Because if, if you don't innovate, your competitors are going to innovate and you know, the, this, you know, the company that you're in is going to fail. There's a big responsibility for us to, to be able to move fast. And this is really one of the driving factors behind all this. Now, <clears throat> in order to, uh, also what's happening here is that each one of these things I'm showing is independently deployable. And that's a really important feature. But I think even more importantly and that is, is this co uh, concept of loosely coupled. The things need to be loosely coupled. So I'm going to hammer on that quite a bit. So the monolith. Uh, the monolith, you know, it's been around for a long time. Somebody, some people say decades, a few decades. I say it's been around for half a century, so, you know, since computing kind of really took off uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. We're, you know, we were building monoliths back then. We're still building monoliths. It's just gotten the technology has constantly improved. So now we're at the point where there's a lot of us that know how to build monoliths. And some people are asking, well, why are we running away from monoliths when we know how to do it, we've got good tools to do it, and things like that? And I think they, they make some good points. Now, maybe one thing I've, uh, you know, the, the shape I've used here for the monolith, um, some of you may recognize this. I'll give you a hint. Yeah, it, it came from a movie. Anybody recognize what it is? 2001, thank you. So uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, which is a movie that's 51 years old, 
that still seems to be advanced. But every time I hear the word monolith, because I was a, I'm a huge fan of this movie, I, I think of this goofy shape as one by four by nine is, is the ratio. But in any case, um, some people have argued that if you can't properly modularize your monolith, then what makes you think that you can build a microservice system? You know, replace the monolith with a microservice system. And they make some good points, but um, I think I'd kind of co come back to that with, well, we didn't have the great tools for modularizing our monolithic application. And the, the whole point of modularizing is you're trying to isolate pieces of code from other pieces of code. Typically, like I'm a Java developer, and I've been developing Java applications for a long time. And I was always, we just said public, you know, the, the visibility of a class, the visibility of a method, almost always was public. We didn't really think about modularization. Now, Java has evolved recently where modules are formally part of the language, but that, this was never a big concern of ours to, to modularize our, our monolithic systems. But the, the whole point of what the, you know, they're trying to make here is that if you had um, some good modularization in your monolith, you can get some of that innovation velocity, even with a monolith, where you want to deploy the monolith, you changes to the monolith as quickly as possible. I grew up in an era where you know, our release cycles are like every six months. They were torturous. You know, we, we went through a design phase, and an implementation phase, and a test phase, and then, then we did a horrible deployment over a weekend usually, and then we repeated the process. I hated those types of things. I love what we're, we are now today, where we're in rapid deployment cycles, and we don't, you know, I actually saw a book once called Death March, and I knew immediately what it was about because it was, it was talking about the old project life cycles. Now, the new project life cycles should be very, very short. We should be able to deploy new features as quickly as possible. People are doing this with monoliths, but times are changing. Now, another thing to consider is I'm showing here like a thousand monoliths, you know, 25 by 40. I worked at Hewlett Packard for a long time, and for a good part of that, I was in IT, the enterprise IT of Hewlett Packard. We had a portfolio of over 2,000 applications in the company. They wanted to get it down to around 1,000, but that's a lot of code to migrate to new technology, a lot of expense, a lot of training, and so on. So depending on how big your, your enterprise is, this could be a lot of work to move. But in any case, you know, over the last five, six, seven years, uh, we, many of you have been doing uh, microservice types of systems. And the idea is that the, you know, the monolith is kind of broken up into a collection of microservices. And the, you know, one approach that some use was that you gradually replace some of the functionality of the monolith with microservices. So you, you slowly built up your, your suite of microservices so that you eventually replace the monolith. Some people do it where they just build a whole new microservice system, turn it on, and turn off the monolith. There's all kinds of different approaches that are used. But the point is that we're replacing the functionality that was in a monolith, you know, implemented using monolithic tools and technologies with tools and technologies used for building microservices. Now, this has matured fairly well at this point. There's a fair amount of good tools around. There's a lot of expertise. We've been talking about these things in conferences for a long time. There's a lot of books and articles about it. Um, but it's been interesting to watch how things have, have progressed there. And I'll, I'll show you some of that in just a few minutes. But time marches on, and so the new toy for us is serverless. So the idea there is that we're going to even finer grained units of deployable functionality, deployable to production, where, say, a given microservice you know, is maybe con composed of what would be implemented as multiple uh, serverless functions. Now, the ratios that I'm showing here are just arbitrary. So don't put any credence in and say, oh yeah, this guy said there's, you know, for every microservice you should replace it with eight functions, you know, serverless functions. That's not what the point. It just it worked out that way nice, nicely here for the, the, the diagrams. But there is this decreasing level of granularity that's occurring. So we're getting into f serverless, where the serverless functions are very discreet relative to even microservices. They do one thing. They do it really well. And the tools, are interestingly, are a little bit more constrained than they were in 
monoliths and cert in even in microservices. How we had a lot of flexibility in how we build microservices. We certainly had a lot of flexibility how we build monoliths. Getting into the serverless world, how we build serverless code gets a little bit more constrained, and I think that's quite interesting. Now, some of the leaders, of course, have been, you know, Amazon came out with lambdas, what they call lambdas, uh, I think it was around 2014 or so. And I've talked to some people that work there, like, uh, for example, another developer advocate there, and they said people are just flocking to uh, serverless. You know, they can't, it's almost like they can't keep up with it, you know, just adding more and more infrastructure to support the customers that want to build serverless systems. So there's a, a pretty aggressive migration that's moving there. But um, another term that you'll hear often is function as a service. And th I think this is very appropriate because you have a deployable function that you know, does some, a fa fairly discrete thing well, and you deploy that to production. So you implement whatever you want to implement as a collection of these deployable functions. That's the idea. So it's finer grained than typically than the kinds of functionality that you would implement in microservices, and certainly finer grained than what we implemented in, in monoliths. So the reason why, you know, a lot of people say, well, of course, this, you know, we call it serverless, but the server's there. It's like, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we all get that. But I think the big deal here with serverless is that prior to serverless, often as developers and architects, you know, there was this dreaded question I always remember getting is like, well, how much capacity do you need? And the capacity was kind of measured in two dimensions. How much CPU capacity do you need? How much memory ca capacity to, do you need? And they come to us in these projects and they go, oh man, now here comes the question again. It's like, okay, I need to come up with this answer or my team does. And it's like, what do we say? How, how much capacity? And almost always it was a wild guess. There was almost no science to it. We, we basically say, well, it kind of feels like it's this big, so we need this much capacity. Let's go with that, right? The scary part of this, though, is that you were trying to size it, not so much for the day-to-day -day use, but you were trying to size your capacity for those spikes. It could be weekly spikes. It could be monthly spikes, quarterly spikes, seasonal spikes. Like, you know, the, we always hear about the legendary failures during big shopping days like, Black Friday and Cyber Monday and then Singles Day, you know, November 11th in China is, is the biggest day, you know, as far as the amount of traffic that systems have to handle. And often we don't have scalable systems. Now, that be has become a feature in some environments, in some cloud environments, but many times we had to scale the capacity to fit those spikes. So what would happen is we're running our codes, they were running a monolith and the system and the memory utilization and the CPU utilization is bouncing around depending on what's happening in the system. But here comes that spike, and we gotta have the capacity for it. And if we don't, then, you know, like if it's a Java app and it runs out of memory, bad things really happen. If it runs out of CPU, customers get mad as well. You know, you're, you're, you need to have that sufficient capacity. So there's always this, this game. And it didn't matter, um, if it was on uh, physical machines or virtual machines, fr from our perspective, as you know, we, we just needed capacity. We needed a certain amount of CPU, we needed a certain amount of memory, and we needed to run with that. But often, in between those peaks, there's relatively small or little activity that's going on. That's kind of what I'm trying to show here, is that this process is running, it's eating up a certain amount of memory, it's eating up about a certain amount of CPU, it's kind of jumping around depending on the load, maybe you get a little minor spike, but then, the end of the, at the end of the day, what we're typically seeing is that the average utilization of the infrastructure that we allocate for everything that we need, production, development, testing, and so on, the average utilization is around 10%. This was the case in Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard was a company that made servers. We had tens of thousands of servers that supported IT. What drove the IT managers nuts was that they looked at what was the utilization, you know, they can easily get that metric from all of these machines and it averaged out to be 10%. And they're thinking, oh my gosh, we got all this capacity and we can't figure out how to use it. it drove them crazy, we couldn't get over it. Well, guess what? Same thing with VMs and it's the same thing with VMs that run in, run in the cloud. The typical utilization of cloud servers is around 10%. Now here comes Kubernetes, which is interesting, really interesting, but Basically, 
Kubernetes, what you do is you set up a cluster of Kubernetes nodes, which are, you know, they have two dimensions. They have so, so much memory, they have so much CPU. You plug that into the Kubernetes cluster, and then Kubernetes goes to town to figure out where to run things. And the way you run things is that you say, all right, I have this container I want to run, and it's going to run in this pod. Now, pod can run more than one container, but let's just keep it simple. So you, you want to run what's called a pod in a Kubernetes environment. So you just tell Kubernetes, hey, Kubernetes, please run this pod. And then one of the things we have to tell Kubernetes is, well, how much CPU do you want? You know, how much, how much do you request in CPU, and how much do you request in memory? So it's basically kind of filling in that square. Where is there a place in my cluster that has sufficient capacity to handle the CPU and memory requests for that pod? Now, it doesn't mean that the pod's actually using it. The process inside of it may be idle, may be busy. Who knows? But the, the pod itself is eating up some, capac some capacity. So here I'm showing like the, th this um, server right next to me here. Um, it's fully utilized. It doesn't have any more capacity because there's four pods running, and those four pods have consumed all the CPU resources. But other, other uh, nodes in the, in the Kubernetes cluster have space, so if a, if a request comes in to run another pod, it can go. So it's a nice environment that helps us maybe get more utilization out of the physical infrastructure that we have, or maybe more utilization out of the uh, virtual machines you rent from the cloud, but we're still dealing with, we have to have sufficient capacity to run everything. You're still paying for that, even though uh, it, may, it may not be uh, totally in use. This all changes in serverless. All of that is gone. All of that is like, I like to think of it as, you know, there's this nice table, and all that complexity is abstracted away. With serverless, we come along and say, I got this function, and I want to put some kind of a limiter on it, but the, so it doesn't you know, just run to an infinite capacity, but basically you have this function, and you're only paying for the CPU and memory that that's, that function uses while it's in use. So if it's busy, you're paying more. If it's not busy, you're paying less. If it's not running at all, you're paying nothing. And we're, we don't have to think about or worry about capacity at the server level. That's all abstracted away for us. This is why, it's, to me, it's called serverless, that we, we don't have to think about that, which is huge. So the responsibility for having sufficient capacity now falls on the serverless provider, which is not us. You know, if, if you're going to a serverless environment in the, in the cloud, your whole financial model has changed completely. And you're not paying for stuff that's sitting there idle most of the time. That's the new thing. Now, kind of getting back to the three, you know, the three approaches for building systems. You know, typically, when we think about breaking up a system, we think about breaking up the code. But wait a minute, you know, the, the application also has a database associated with it. So that's what I'm trying to show here. There's, you know, there's a monolithic code up top, but there's also a monolithic database down below. A pattern that I often see for people that are implementing microservice systems is that they figure out how to break up the code, but often it's much more difficult to break up the database. So how many people have done uh, my microservice system in here. How many people have been able to break up the database? A few. Oh, that's pretty good. Okay. So that's the idea because the, 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 the challenge here is that we want to have that loose coupling again that I talked about at the beginning. And with the loose coupling, you, you have a, a form of tight coupling here when you have when, when all of our microservices are sharing a database. So it's like you and I are on a microservice team and we say, oh, we need to make some schema changes. And then we have to go and talk to everybody else that may be affected by those changes. And the way I look at it is that that's friction. That's slowing us down. We have to talk to the other people. We have to negotiate. We may have to do a co coordinated deployment where the, the, other you know, the other microservice teams have to make changes to, on their side. And it could be a mess. It's friction. It slows us down. It slows down that innovation velocity. So the idea is that Every microservice should own its own schema. Not saying that it should own its own database infrastructure, but it should own its own schema. So the idea is that now you have all these different microservices that um, are, th their schema is self-contained. It's a private thing to the microservice itself. So in a way, 
the microservice is treated as a black box all the way from the code into the data. So all these microservices should be as autonomous as possible, code and data. So you get this, uh, you know, this, a form of looser coupling, less friction when you want to make changes. So if you want to make changes to your schema, that's a private thing amongst the team that's responsible for that, that microservice. It shouldn't have to be negotiated with anybody outside of the microservice team because it's something that is only known inside the microservice team. Here's another form of coupling, though, that I want to show you that's fairly common with microservices. You know, I've arranged the microservices in this ring, and I'm showing a microservice where there's one, one microservice at the bottom here that's referenced by say, four, these four other microservices at the top. So this is fine. This is really easy to build. Say it, you know, the microservice at the bottom has some RESTful APIs. These other services are, are just making simple REST calls to it. Everything's great, right? Simple implement. It, these, this is easy to do. We, you know, as developers, we can do this all day long. But, the, but it's also a form of coupling. And it's a form of coupling that um, uh, can burn you in production as well. And what I mean by that is that if the reference service gets in trouble, if it goes down, or even maybe even worse, it slows down, it impacts the other uh, microservices that reference it. So the blast area of a problem can be much larger. It could, the overall application could be affected um, in, in, in a not great way if, if there's a failure of a single microservice. So this is a form of coupling. An alternative approach, is, and this is also a synchronous form of coupling, you know, that there's a synchronous request response going on between the client and the, the, the services providing the, the response. But here's an alternative approach. And it's all based on using some form of a message, message bus like Kafka. So you get into more of an asynchronous pattern. And just for fun, I threw in these little light blue um, boxes represent analytic services. And, and this is a point for another audience, but the idea here is that these um, analytic services, you know, maybe they're doing Spark or whatever on the inside, but trying to black box them. There's, I don't care what you do on the inside. All I care about is what you, what information you provide on the outside. Don't bore me with the details, you know, of how you've implemented it. Black box, it doesn't matter if it's a really sophisticated AI service or it's a relatively straightforward, say, microservice. But let's walk through a scenario where Hopefully you can see it. There's a red arrow pointing to one of the services. You're just going to kind of go on through an asynchronous conversation. So this service goes, eh, something happened. Maybe, you know, I'm not showing it, but something came into this service and triggered it to publish something to a topic. Okay? It's done. And then there's subscribers. So in this little example scenario, there's three subscriber services. So they pick up whatever was published by that one service. So we kind of repeat over and over where the service is publishing. And then the one of these analytic services was seeing all this data coming in and goes, hey, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a trend here. Maybe it's a fraud detection service. And it's going, hey, I, I've detected some fraudulent activity. So it, it's just going to publish that. It doesn't care. It doesn't really care who consumes it. It's just saying, oh, some fraudulent activity occurred. I'm done. My, my service is done. And it, it's not coupled with any other service. But it just so happens that there are other services that are interested including the service that we've been watching. So now this other service that was kind of putting out the trend data and saying, you know, that say a customer was doing something that looked suspicious and another service detected that, you know, it notified this other, this first service that something's gone wrong. So the idea there is that all of that communication happened asynchronously, right? Which is a little foreign to us. A lot of us, you know, it's even in the first scenario I showed you where the, we're doing RESTful requests, that's like a, a form of remote procedure call, which feels comfortable to many of us as developers. Doing things asynchronous may feel a little uncomfortable, but it's really kind of the trend of the future, it seems. Every, there's a lot of people uh, really saying that this is the way we should be going. But here's another example. Say one of those consumer services is down. Now let's replay that scenario. So the service on the... Uh, on the right, or I'm sorry, on the left is publishing. The down service can't consume those messages, so it's publishing along, it's just kind of humming along. And then at some point, the service that was down comes back up. Well, it just consumes those messages that we're waiting for, right? And then it catches up. So this is, you know, the blast area is kind of contained if you're using some of these asynchronous patterns. 
This is going to get, it, I think, important in the serverless environment. So with the serverless environment, it's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm just going to show you some real general concepts, but it's one of those things where I think the way we build systems is a little bit more constrained. It's basic and fundamental, but it's like it's almost like they're going to give us some Lego blocks. And you know, with Lego blocks, they're real simple little things, but people do really marvelous, build marvelous structures and toys with them. They, you can do you know, some pretty complex things with fundamental building blocks. And I think that's what we're going to be getting in serverless. So here's one example that's very common. You have some kind of a function that's receiving incoming HTTP requests. That function does some work. Maybe it does some CRUD. You know, create, read, update, delete to a regular old, good old database. You know, we know how to, a lot of us know how to do CRUD, and it sends back a response. Cool, right? So you got a stateless CRUD pattern ready to go. That's pretty nice. I think this one's mo even more interesting, and this is very similar, except you've got a a, a function that is a subscriber to some topic is pulling in events from some topic, reacting to those events, and maybe publishing new events out downstream to another topic. And maybe in the middle, it's doing, it could be doing some CRUD or whatever it's doing, but it's uh, a flow of events through it. And then just a little hybrid, and it's kind of a little bit of maybe a wishful thinking on my part, is that you got that first pattern with the possibility of, of publishing out. So let me show you uh, an example. So here's the kind of the three patterns laid out, real simple, like almost like Lego blocks. But here's how some of them start to plug together. This is a, uh, seems to be a pretty common pattern, where, say, there's data coming in from the edge. And by the edge, I mean it's coming in from outside of the system, you know, via HTTP, for example. Comes into some function. That function you know, puts something into a database. Now, on Amazon, if it could be S3 or uh, DynamoDB. And those guys can be configured to, when something happens in the database, they can publish an event to a topic, in a way. And then other functions could be waiting for those events. So you're, you're linking all this together. So this is where I think things are going to become very interesting, is that we're going to be in this pattern more of a more event-driven type of systems architecture built using these relatively simple uh, building blocks. And we're going to link them together like Lego blocks, and we're going to build really cool systems. And this is what I think um, Peter, people are already starting to do. But here I'm trying to show <clears throat> that, say, on, on the left, you know, we've got something that's, say, receiving information from over the edge, you know, HTTP coming in from humans or from devices or whatever. And then <clears throat> that triggers events that are going downstream to other functions which consume them, do some processing, and then emit events that are consumed downstream and, and so on. So this is, there's a really good, um, I've seen a recently about maybe s six months ago, a great Amazon presentation, and they were basically sh showing this flow. And part of the flow was that some of these things were actually doing things like AI. You know, you know uh, uh, a function that had, that was like the tip of the iceberg of doing some intelligent computation. But it was just, an, it, from this perspective, it was just another junction in the flow. Really powerful. So <clears throat> the uh, getting into the making a fool of myself. Um, going back to this pattern. This is a rant on my part, but I'm showing the input output you know, is red and green. Input is red, output is green. And this is real common for us, is that you know, HTTP requests in, do some work, and you send an HTTP response back out. But wouldn't it be nice? if we could get a request in, but the responses come later down the flow. And what got me thinking about this is that, you know, think about ourselves. We um, say we're texting. We see something on the screen with our eyes or using some other mechanism. We react to that. We process that through, through a series of functions. But then the output comes in some other way, like through our limbs. We type something um, on a keyboard or on a, on, you know, we're tapping glass, right? So in by, you know, it, the normal natural flow is that you get input from one thing, but output's coming from something else. You hear something, 
and maybe you react. You know, you hear something and then you talk, okay? This is what I'm trying to say here is that it seems from this perspective that it's almost unnatural that, you know, the request response has to, you know, be this kind of tight loop. And what I'm just saying is that maybe it would be nice if um, as things are going downstream, we could proce process it back out. But this is kind of my wishful thinking. Um, something a little bit more real is that often when you hear about um, serverless, you hear about stateless functions. And that's great. We, we, we can easily build stateless functions that do things like CRUD. This is a common pattern um, that, that things are, where things are being done. And the challenge, though, is that just like serverless, there's, there really is servers. With stateless, there still really is state. But what's happening is that you've got this function. It gets some kind of request in. It's going to reach into the database and pull the state in, pull it out of the database, do some work with it, and make changes to the state, and then give back the response, and then forget everything. Right? So every request, you've got to pull the state in, do some work, push it back out. Now, for lots of applications, this is perfectly fine. It's a good pattern. If you can do it this way and you don't have any performance constraints or anything like that, then fine. But you're putting a lot of burden of responsibility on the database. So sometimes databases can reach a threshold where they're just not going to go any faster. I've been in these kinds of situations and it's not fun. But for many applications, this works just perfectly. However, there's work going on. Um, we're doing some things in my company at Lightbend, and there's other people doing. In fact, I heard, I heard about another one just today. That's you know, just today I got I saw it on email. But the idea is that you have what's being called a stateful uh, function, and here the concept is that you you essentially have um, a function represents an instance of an entity. So it's like say all of us are hitting a system and we're creating orders on the system right now, okay, and so we each have our own shopping cart. So in the system, in a, you've, we've implemented a system with serverless functions. There's instances of the serverless function for each and every one of us. Each one of us has our own instance. And what's happened is that if this order was, had already been persisted before, maybe we did some work and then we came back, you know, it'll lift out of the database once the current state of the order. And it's using, the approach generally is an event log. This is like, you know, event sourcing and command query responsibility type patterns. So the idea is that when the first time the function gets hit and it lights up, you know, the, the function is started for a given entity, it pulls the state out of the database. But then from that point on, as changes are coming in, like add item to cart, remove item from cart, update the count, all these kinds of things, all that's happening is the function's not having to go back and re re retrieve all the data all again. All it's doing is emitting events. Oops, I, I added an item to a cart. Put that in the log. I, I removed an item from cart. Put that in the log. Updated item from cart. Put that in the log. So the, the I.O. pattern has changed significantly. And some of the performance tests I've seen done this like order of magnitude faster in, because you're, you're hitting the database uh, far less often. So this is pretty exciting. It's pretty new. And, and that's the general idea. And to kind of wrap things up, this feels like where we're going, it feels somewhat natural. I mean, I'm no AI guy or machine learning guy, but I'm interested in that. I've been looking at, you know, kind of reading about neural networks and all that kind of stuff. It's really interesting. And I've also been looking a little bit at biology. There's some really good videos, by the way, on, on what, uh, how neurons perform and, and how they work in you know, nervous systems and so on. Very, very interesting. But the flow of where we're heading with computing, like stringing things together, starts to feel a little bit more natural, like the flow that's used for computing that nature invented. And, you know, I think, you know, in a way I feel like we're heading in that direction. And we may be heading there really fast, faster than we realize. So it's really exciting times. So anyways, that's kind of the, the, uh, the, the tour here. Hopefully you found this somewhat informative. Um, if you're interested in, in more about stateful serverless and what's happening there, um, my company is working on an open source project called CloudState.io. The other one that I just heard about today is called StateFund.io. Here's a link to this talk. 
and thank you very much. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, now is the time for questions. So can we take a look? Well, okay. Uh, let's see the first one. It's about how serverless code should be organized in your. Yeah, that's it. I. You know, I wanted to show that in the diagram, but I, I just didn't have enough time. There were like a, <laughs> there's like a hundred slides in this presentation, and I was really worried about you know, getting this all done in time. Um, that's an excellent question. I think that um, you're going to see. Um, it's going to be that like pools of microservices that um, you know represented like a discrete discrete function that we used to implement as a microservices and multiple pools of these functions represent an entire application. But how they get organized, I think, is uh, a raw new territory. I don't. I haven't seen. I mean, I'm by, by no means an expert in this area. But I'm a curious developer. I'm trying to wrap my head around what's happening in the serverless space. And I'm asking the same question. And I haven't really seen some good answers there, like how do we organize uh, those things. I think it's just going to be, we're going to have to invent it as we go uh, until some of the tooling starts to, uh, to improve for that. Cool. Um, the next question is about um, actually the data, how, how the data should be handled in serverless world. <laughs> Same thing, I think um, the data footprint should be as small as possible, but not too small, which is easy for me to say, <laughs> but maybe not easy for us to do. Where um, I like the footprint that um, we started to get with microservices, where we had a relatively, I mean, we had a uh, a microservice that owned its own schema. And <clears throat> I think at, the, at this time, the general idea is that if you think of all the functions in a serverless environment that kind of really tightly go together, they probably should all share a database because one team is responsible for that. And many, in many cases, uh, people have argued even with microservices that one team, there isn't like a team per microservices. There's a team that's responsible for n number of microservices. So in many cases, the scope of the visibility of data, of code, is driven sometimes by team size versus, um, you know, say, microservice size or a collection of serverless functions. Okay. I think, like, we have a lot of questions, actually. We can handle all of them. So maybe, maybe the last one, the most upvoted. Um, okay. Uh, you showed this pattern with message bus, but in the end there is front end and the user is waiting for the response. Is it good to think wait for message as response? Oh man, excellent question, excellent question. Um, and that, that I mentioned that this feels, you know, when we start, you know, you know I, I said, yeah, we should build the system asynchronously, and a lot of you going, oh, what does this guy crazy? You know, because it's like we're waiting, but the the idea is that you um, you you try and you want to get back to the user as quickly as possible, for sure. But I think what the opportunity is open up when you start to build things asynchronously is you only do the minimal amount of work to keep the customer happy. Do that as quickly as possible. Get back to the users, and so the user is happy. But then that triggers other things that are happening after the fact. And um, one scenario that I've, has been written about, um, and I, I, I like to use it as well, is real quick, is like, say you have two microservices, and they're talking to each other asynchronously. So one of them is an order microservice, and another one is, is a, say, a customer credit microservice. The order is placed, and we tell the customer the order is placed, but the order is in a, in a new state. Now, behind the scenes, after we told the customer, yep, we got your order, things start happening and say this customer credit service picks up, oh yeah, the order was placed, let me check the credit of that customer, and the response is going to be either credit approved or credit rejected, which happens to be uh, the order service is a, a subscriber of this other service. So the other service comes back and says credit approved or credit rejected. That happens after the fact. So the idea is that 
we satisfied the, um, you know, the short-term um, think time that we have to have for the user. And for the vast majority of customers, they're going to get credit approved, but some of them are going to get credit rejected. But it happens asynchronously. So maybe an email goes back to the customer and says, sorry, there's a problem with your order. But for most customers, it's not. The whole point of it is that we minimize how much work we did. In, in, a, in a monolithic system or in a system where we're doing remote procedure calls and everything, and we want to do everything fast, maybe we're doing too many things. We want to make sure the order is completely good to go and do all the different steps to do that and then go back to the customer. And the customer is waiting. Here, and I think uh, Amazon is, is one of the ones that really does this, is that they want to take the, or do the minimal amount of work so that they capture the order from the customer and then let the customer know we got it and then things happen behind the scenes. And the order status gets updated asynchronously behind the scenes. Again, it's a really different way of thinking about building systems, but um, I think it's very, very powerful. It's just we got to wrap our heads around it. Okay. Unfortunately, we, we are out of time, so we can't continue, but feel free to have a chat with you after his talk. So again, thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>